going to work. Okay, I'm going to start. Greetings. My name is Michael Wright. I'm a program director for Peace Catalyst International and a Christian evangelical organization that seeks to promote greater understanding and edifying relationships between Christians and Muslims. This blog, entitled Divine Wink, can be defined in many ways. An important divine wink is the expression of God's applause when people who take their faith in God seriously come together for mutual edification and enlightenment, despite our religious differences. I find that most religious misunderstandings occur because of differences in perspective rather than differences in belief. The words divine wink are derived from Acts 17.30 in the New Testament, which says, And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. I encourage you to subscribe to my YouTube channel to explore additional divine winks that lead to common ground between Christianity and Islam. Dr. Safi Kaskas joins me today. He has studied, studied Abrahamic religions and lectured throughout the United States on subjects related to Islam, the development of American Muslims, and the future of Islam in the U.S. With his study of the earlier fo early followers of Jesus and the development of the early church, he regularly speaks at universities, colleges, and churches on reconciliation between evangelicals and American Muslims. Dr. Kaskis and I share these goals for reconciliation between our two religions. I would add that Dr. Kaskis has also produced a unique modern English translation of the Holy Quran. Not only is it easier to understand for today's English speakers, this translation also includes cross-references to the Holy Bible that demonstrate the Quran's ties to it. Today, Dr. Kaskis and I are going to discuss a rather controversial subject for many, and that is jihad. And so to get started, Dr. Kaskis, what should we understand by the, the word jihad? The word jihad simply means struggle. It can be one struggling to tame his own ego. It can be struggling from a better person, struggling to provide the uh, uh, food on the table for his family, earn a living, find shelter. All these are struggles that uh, the Quran urges Muslims to go through in their daily life in order to be good providers, good people, uh, good neighbors. This is basically what the word jihad in the Quran means. That's interesting. You know, if I turn on CNN and watch the news, Seems like they talk about jihad, jihad in terms of suicide bombers and, and, and Muslims who are killing innocent people. Uh, that's a lot different from what you just described. Uh, what am I missing? Well, uh, you're, you're not missing anything because what you're hearing on CNN is also true. Some Muslims in the 21st century misunderstand the word jihad and are misled by tremendous oppression that they experience to uh, try to do these atrocities and uh, call them jihad. Actually, there is a difference in Arabic, in the Quran, there is a difference between the word jihad, which is struggle, that I explained to you, and the word qital, which means fighting. The word qital has rules and regulations. Uh, qital can only be justified if a Muslim state, if it exists, when it exists, if a Muslim state is attacked, so the only fighting is justified for self-defense. Uh, fighting is not justified to build an empire like it happened in the first and the second century of the Islamic history. That is not in the Quran. It, there is no order in the Quran that tells Muslim, go and expand beyond your, your borders and try to uh, expand all the way to Armenia, for instance. Uh, this was done, though, in context of other aggre aggression from the uh, Byzantine Empire and the Persian Empire against the newly established Muslim state. 
So Muslims defended themselves against the Byzantine and beat them. So naturally they expanded. And uh, again, they were attacked by the Persian, you know? So they fought to defend themselves and beat the Persian, which was unconceivable in anybody's mind at that time, but they won. So they expanded eastward and westward and uh, became an empire themselves. But the Quran itself, when it talks about jihad, talks about a struggle, a person, any Muslim should be engaged in to be, become a better person. Uh, one day, there is a saying of the Prophet Muhammad that uh, uh, we all, all Muslims know, he was coming back from a battle to defend Medina, the city where, where he was living. And he told his companion with him, while they still on horseback going back to Medina, we come back from the minor jihad to the greater jihad. So the battle itself was a minor struggle. The bigger struggle is when you get back home and you have to face every day's shores and to face every day's ego. And you have to deal with that on daily basis to become a better person. That's the greater struggle. So there is a difference. What's important for people to understand, there is a difference between the word jihad and the word qital. Jihad is struggle, mainly against one's ego. Uh, qital is fighting mainly against people who are uh, attacking a Muslim state when that state exists. For instance, let's take Egypt today. Egypt is not considered a Muslim state. So if Israel is attacking Egypt, Israel is not attacking a Muslim state. It's attacking a state where the majority of the people are Muslims, but it's not the Muslim state. Iran took upon itself to call itself the, the, the Islamic Republic. So it gave itself that title. So they consider, if they're attacked, they consider it's an attack on Islam. But that's what they consider. If, if the Iranians are attacked, would the Algerian consider this an attack against Islam? We have to ask them. I don't think they would. So in the mind of, in the Western mind, instead of making these concepts very clear, so an, an average American will understand what's going on in the world. We confuse them by creating a new enemy called Islam. So this new enemy actually was our ally when we were struggling against the Soviet Union in Afghanistan. At that time, President Reagan received the Afghani Mujahideen, as they like to call themselves and as he called them, and he compared them to our founding fathers. Was he confused or was he trying to what? He knew that those people are not against United States. They were fighting the, Un the Soviet Union on behalf of the United States. And he sent the CIA to back them with money, to back them with weapons, with missiles, and he trained them. And then when, the, when they won their war in Afghanistan in the late 70s, and the Soviet Union had to withdraw from Afghanistan, suddenly they became, became an enemy to the United States in the mind of the media, in the mind of those that would like to always uh, create an enemy that, uh, that the United States have to fight. Muslims are not enemies of the United States. I am an American Muslim. The most important thing for me to defend is my American constitution because it gives me my American rights. So, and the same, the same way somebody in Egypt, for instance, would feel about the United States because in 1956, President Eisenhower told Israel, Great Britain and France, who were attacking Egypt to stop and leave. At that time, the Egyptian considered the United States to be the greatest friend and pictures of President Eisenhower were hanging in every house. So it takes two to tango. The Muslim world does not consider itself an enemy to the United States unless the United States commit acts of aggression against civilians, against people that didn't expect it. 
Did I answer your question? Well, I, I think I'm coming to a better understanding. So uh, it appears to me, if I understand correctly, the greater jihad is uh, the inner struggle within an individual yes. that deals with temptation and, and such things as that. Ego. Anything you yeah, any will ask you to do, you try to do the opposite. This way you yeah. tame your ego. This way you can do your five prayers a day. You don't overeat. You don't over drink, you don't uh, look at other women, you don't, uh, anything that has to do with the ego, we try to find, and that's the greater jihad. That sounds like a pretty, pretty uh, difficult struggle to deal with. That's why it's called the greater struggle. Yeah. yeah. So back to the, the, the inner jihad, or the, the lesser jihad, that would be, that would be some kind of warfare. Well, in, so, or, or def yes. Now, let, would, me, let me explain it. Once, once there is an Islamic state, in other words, as a state that identified it, itself with the rule of Islam, and it is attacked, the state, the, the, the government of that state should declare war. And the government of that state should recruit people to fight. Uh, the fight is not a personal responsibility. I cannot myself, for instance, decide that in Mexico they are persecuting Muslim, therefore I'm going to go and attack Mexico on my own, you know, because this is not an individual responsibility. It has to be a collective responsibility. It has to be the state responsibility, and I should follow the direction of whoever is governing the state at that time, an elected leader, a, an appointed leader, a king, whatever, but it's not an individual responsibility. So I cannot declare war personally on anybody. So by that, I would understand then that, um, for example, Osama bin Laden, he organized the attacks on the trade tower, the, the, the towers yeah. in New York and the, and the Pentagon, Yes. That was not a legitimate jihad then. Well, who is he? Who does he represent? That's what I'm saying. He, the he fact that he... He doesn't represent anybody. He, yeah. he was helping the Afghanis in their struggle against the Soviets. Right. He was trained by the CIA, financed by the CIA, given weapons by the CIA. And suddenly when the American landed in Saudi Arabia, he considered that to be... A, an act against his belief and against what Islam teaches. In his mind, uh, the Americans should not have landed in Saudi Arabia. Even if the Saudi government invited them, they should not go there. So he, he on his own, with his own warped, warped understanding, declared war against the United States. That mm -hmm. doesn't make it an Islamic war or a jihad war, except in the minds of those who are fanatic or follow Osama bin Laden. But those who don't follow Osama bin Laden don't even recognize his leadership. They don't follow him. And that's the absolute majority of the Muslim world. We are 1.6 billion people. How many Osama bin Laden had uh, following him to, uh, to, to support him? You know, less than 0.001% of the Muslim world, you know. Osama mm -hmm. bin Laden is an enemy that uh, was created, created by people that like to see a war, this war against uh, the Muslim world. And, uh, you know, with time, we'll know more about it as records become open and uh, available to the public, that the Muslim world never desired to fight the United States. We're not enemies. We refuse to be enemies. Mm -hmm. So let me see if I understand then. So with respect to lesser jihad, uh, lesser jihad can only occur under two circumstances, if, as I understand it. Number one, it must be uh, initiated by a legitimate government. Yes. And number two, it can only occur by that government in, in its own self-defense. Yes, absolutely. Indeed. Now, let's say that United States was attacking Saudi Arabia and Saudi, the Saudi government. 
decided to call its own people for jihad. It becomes mandatory on every available and able person that can fight to go and join the fight. But that mm -hmm. didn't happen. That did not happen. What happened is a band that was well known and, and trained by the CIA declared war in the United States. And in my mind, this, this was absurd. Didn't make any sense. Disturbed my life for the last 25 years. You know, we, we, neither we recognize Osama bin Laden's leadership, nor was he legitimately leading, nor did, did his interpretation meet approval. I mean, only his band of supporters uh, supported him. But I didn't support him. None of my friends supported him. I don't know anybody in my family that supports him. Mm -hmm. You know, so, but yet the media, first of all, look, it, it went in stages. First of all, they say the fanatic Muslims are attacking. Then they say, well, maybe their book teach them to attack us. So now the Quran is suspect. Third, they said, well, their prophet with his behavior told them to attack the enemies and kill them. And they use parts of verses. Kill them anywhere you find them. They, that's a famous verse that they, that they, it was all over the network. Kill who? Kill who? The Quran is talking about a specific war, not a general war, a specific war between mm -hmm. the Muslims who left Mecca to Medina to hide and the people of Mecca who kept trying to catch up with them and kill them. Yes. It was permitted for the Muslims at that time, only with a permission from God. Before that, it wasn't permitted for them to fight. Only at that time, they received permission because they were oppressed to repel the oppressor, oppressors and to fight. Yes, go face them. Kill them if you can because you're defending your own self. If you don't kill them, they're going to kill you. You know? So, uh, and... But if they, if they stop fighting, you need to stop fighting immediately. If they change their mind and withdraw, stop, don't pursue them, stop the fight. This is what the Quran says. So it is in self-defense. Yes, kill them when you face them, otherwise they will kill you, you know? And until today, the concept of just war, it's still debated in the Muslim world. Mm -hmm. When is it legitimate for Muslims to fight uh, what they will consider a legitimate war? It's, it's, not, it's not really that clear, you know? Mm -hmm. so, so let me see if I can summarize then and then on, on the, the lesser jihad, and then I'd like to maybe talk a little bit more about the greater jihad. Okay. So again, it's two, two issues. Number one, there, there must be a government involved and uh number two uh jihad will not occur unless that government is attacked first absolutely self-defense yeah there is no other justification look people can create for themselves justifications to fight for instance give you a for instance i mean we have a lot of negativity also in the muslim history after the umayyad took over the the islamic empire and expanded it, they like the fact that they're getting a lot of uh, bounties back, a lot of money back, a lot of uh, uh, wealth coming from the defeated nations. In a sense, they discovered that they can defeat everybody else. So they, they went on a, uh, like crazy all the way to China. But see, this has nothing to do with Islam. It's someone who discovered he can rule many states and he went after it. He could have been uh, any religion, doesn't really matter. You know, Islam has nothing to do with building an empire. Islam has to do with a better relationship between me and my creator and between me and you, my neighbor. That's all. Yeah. It doesn't say uh, go after this state and that state and make sure the whole world 
become Muslims. It's, that's not what the Quran says. All someone need to do is read the Quran. And they will, if they have any question, we will be glad to answer them. But uh, I mean, don't generalize. It's just not good to generalize. Often people who generalize are wrong. It occurs to me that um, governments have used uh, Christianity in the same way as a pretext for fighting wars that have really nothing to do with Christianity as well. I mean, it's the same situation. Same situation. I mean, uh, people use religion uh, to, uh, uh, to expand their power, to expand their wealth, to expand the, you know, the areas they govern, the, all kinds of reasons, but uh, which is basically have to do with their egos. So the greater jihad here is a case in point, why it's necessary. Why does the Quran talk about it? Um, Michael, I want to assure you, if you go to the Quran and do a search for the word jihad, nowhere in the Quran that the word jihad appears in relationship to battle. Hmm. Never, ever, not even once. Hmm. What, what, what you will find under the word fighting, Qital, not jihad, qital, fighting. You will mm -hmm. find instructions on how to go and attack the enemy and how to defend yourself later on, you know, and uh, uh, how to respect the dignity of the enemy. If they stop, you need to stop. If they run away, don't pursue them. Uh, if you take a town, uh, leave the innocent uh, away fr from it. Don't, don't, get, uh, don't kill uh, women and children or old people. Don't cut trees. Those are well-established rules of war that Muslims followed to the letter, you yeah. know? So uh, people need to just simply look for, for I mean, Google will, will help you find anything you want so easily. Sure. Yeah. So the, again, on a greater jihad then, again, this is the inner struggle that an individual has in, in order to, you know, you're constantly trying to maybe submit yourself to God, but you, you, you're tempted and uh, you have issues that draw you away from that, that cause you okay. to deviate from that. That, in my mind, is that struggle then. Yes, exactly. Uh, let's, let's use examples. For instance, part of my greater jihad, jihad of my nafs. Nafs means self. I'm mm -hmm. struggling against my own self. Yeah. Okay, and this is detailed in the Quran. Uh, for instance, my wife cooked something very delicious and I'm sitting to eat. I already had enough to quench my, 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 you know, my hunger, to, you know, to satisfy me. But because it's delicious, my own self, my own ego wants more. Not because it's helpful for me at this time, at all. Mm -hmm. More food is going to uh, uh, help me gain more weight. It's going to cause me all kind of problems on the long run. So my ego said, it's delicious. Get some more. You know, get another serving. Tell her to give you some more. And my own inner self, inner jihad, will tell me, stop, it's bad for you. Mm -hmm. So I will struggle. There is a struggle between what's good and what's bad within me. And I will stop, you know? Mm. Uh, another example, uh, I see a beautiful woman walking by and I have a chance to meet her and I have a chance to have a conversation with her. My nafs, my inner corrupt self will tell me, well, try, to, try to invite her to have some coffee alone somewhere, try to build a relationship. And my own conscious, my own wise self will tell me, you're married, this is bad for you. Don't do it. You, you're gonna hurt your life, you're gonna hurt your marriage, you're gonna hurt your family, don't do it. So the greater jihad is not something that I'm inventing every single adult person would know exactly what I'm talking about. It's called the greater jihad by the prophet because it is the greater jihad. Mm -hmm. we, we are engaged in that jihad every day of our life. 
for life. And look, I'm 76 years old. I have the tendency to look anytime I see a beautiful woman. You know, just, it's just the way it is. There is no, there is no sense denying it. What, I, what I'm trying to explain, I fight it because I need to go against those bad desires that will end hurting me on the long run, you know? So this is what we do. I would like to read something from the Bible that I think probably describes jihad fairly well. Go ahead, please. And it's from, uh, it's, in, it's in Romans chapter 7. And here's what it says. It says, uh, it's the Apostle Paul writing. He says, what I am doing, I don't understand. For what I want to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that in me that is in my flesh, nothing, no, nothing good dwells. For, to, for the will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I want to do, I don't do it. But the evil I don't want to do, I find that that's what I'm doing. Now, if I do not want to do what I do, it is no longer me, but it is sin that dwells within me. I find then a law that evil is present with me. There is a part of me that wants to do good, for I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. But I see another law in my members warring against the law, the law of my mind and bring me, bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God. So then with the mind, I serve the law of God. But with, with the flesh, I serve the law of sin. Perfect. Uh, you, may not, you may not agree with with everything. You may not hear your understanding of that. Maybe, but I think if I'm understanding correctly, I think it captures the, that inner struggle. Do you agree, Michael? This was perfect, but I will give you even something more perfect that Jesus said. Yeah. If you want to truly understand the inner struggle, each one of us will will have the rest for, for all their life to fight their own uh, self, their own egos. If you want to be first, you have to be last. Sure. If you want life, you have to be willing to lose your life. Mm -hmm. Jesus. And he who would be great example. among him, let him be your servant. Jesus is the best example as a teacher mm -hmm. who taught us how to conquer our own desires. All his teachings were focused, on, like when he said, love your enemies. What is he saying? Your ego wants you to be the victor. You want you to conquer. If you want to conquer, conquer your own self. Love your enemy. Don't go and beat them, even if you're stronger than they are. So I understand what Jesus was taught in me because I also follow his teachings. Sure. Yes. My Christian neighbors should take a look at what the Quran truly says. We find in the Quran what we, what we are looking for. If you're looking to find controversy, you'll find controversy. If you're looking to find good teachings, you'll find good teachings. I think this will be better for all of us as good neighbors in order for us to live in the United States and build this country and make it great. We need to live together in peace under the cover of our constitution that gives me the right to think freely, to act freely, to worship freely, and give you the same rights. This is the way. This is the way for the future, as far as I'm concerned. I agree. Uh, I've, okay, I'll tell you, Dr. Kaskas, I, I, I think uh, you've explained the jihad issue pretty clearly. Uh, and I think uh, 
if uh, somebody's listening to what you had to say today, uh, when they hear something on uh, the, the news that attributes jihad to people who are doing some very wicked things, uh, hopefully we'll, they'll understand that issue a little yes. bit better. It's those, it's those people. Look, it's the Ku Klux Klan, not Christianity. Exactly. Yeah. Good, good I, question. Good example. I, not Islam. Uh -huh. you know? Let's blame those bad people and not the religion that, that uh, they claim. Well, okay. Uh, let me uh, bring this to the end and, and, and say uh, thank you, Dr. Kaskis, for joining me today. Uh, to, you, to you who have listened to our conversation, I encourage you to visit Dr. Kaskis's website, which is at www.kaskis.com. Uh, that name is very easy to spell. It is simply K-A-S-K-A-S. -S. Among other things, the website will show you how to acquire a copy of Dr. Kaskis's translation of the Quran. I also encourage you to read my novel, A Divine Wink, When Love and Religion Become Rivals. In the novel, Adila, a devout Muslim woman, falls in love with Martin, a devout Christian man, and their love struggles to survive opposition from their families and their separate unsympathetic religions. I think you will be pleased to learn how they deal with this opposition. Please go to www.adivinewink.com to make this novel a part of your life. While there, you will also find a link to Peace Catalyst International, which will give you an opportunity to financially support our important work. Please help us. And I thank you. Thank you, Michael.